1973, United Artists successfully launched Roger Moore as their new James Bond in Live and Let Die, a film that actually managed to outgross its Sean Connery starring predecessor, Diamonds Are Forever, by over $40 million worldwide. Clearly audiences more, more, then accepted Raj as the new 007, spurring a bullish United Artists to order Albert R. Broccoli and Harry Saltzman's Eon Productions to rush out a follow-up for release within 18 months to hit theaters by Christmas of 1974. The resulting film would be the final nail in the coffin for the fraying relationship between Broccoli and Saltzman and jeopardize the series itself in the wake of disappointing box office and poor reviews in a film that many, including Roger Moore himself, have dubbed one of the worst James Bond films ever made. And that movie is The Man with the Golden Gun. Given that Eon had to jump right into the film, the creative team from Live and Let Die, which had handled Diamonds Are Forever, was initially left intact. Guy Hamilton would be back to direct the film in his fourth Bond outing, while Tom Mankiewicz would write the script, although after a few drafts, he would drop out and be replaced by returning veteran Richard Maybaum. Opting to adapt Ian Fleming's final Bond novel, The Man with the Golden Gun, the film very nearly got made in the late 60s in Cambodia, although of course that location was scrapped with this being the era of the Cambodian Civil War dramatized in the killing fields. Instead, the film would be mostly shot in Hong Kong and Thailand, with the majority of the book being scrapped in favor of a then topical plot, which would deal with the energy crisis by making the MacGuffin a device that could harness the power of the sun. Unlike other Bond films that would pit 007 against an army of baddies, here Bond would have to face off with a villain whose skills equaled his own, the world's top assassin, Francisco Scaramanga, who is aided by his valet, Nick Knack, played by a pre-fantasy island, Hervé Villachez. His love interest would be Britt Eklund's Club Z agent, Mary Goodnight. Probably the most important role to be cast other than Bond was Scaramanga, and the role was written for Jack Palance, with the idea that the role would be a homage to the villain he played in Shane. Palance turned it down, and they had the inspired idea to hire Christopher Lee, who was actually Ian Fleming's step-cousin and, like him, a formal World War II intelligence agent. He was then at the height of his fame thanks to a series of Hammer horror films that cast him as Dracula, and for him, Scaramanga was a treat, as he got to play a somewhat sympathetic, classy, and urbane villain. Moore, of course, had fun with Lee throughout the shoot, quipping when they entered a cave full of bats, Master, they're yours to command. Lee himself always said that it was a role that he loved doing, even if every day he had to get a full body spray tan, plus the addition of a third nipple, which figures heavily into the plot. The Bond girls, Britt Eklund and Maude Adams, were both Swedes and would apparently joke around in Swedish on the set. Meanwhile, Hervé Villachez was apparently living it up in Thailand, keeping the local brothels busy and constantly bringing prostitutes to the set. Moore went so far as to say that Villachez slept with something like 35 ladies of the night while they were filming and that he had some unnatural lusts. Hervé had a voracious appetite for the ladies. He really looked quite frightful for the first few hours and was asleep a good deal of the day, I think as a result of his um, efforts the night before. Unlike Live and Let Die, this time Albert R. Broccoli would be the onset producer, but in a highly publicized incident, Saltzman, who was sidelined in this one, mistakenly ordered 2,600 pairs of elephant shoes for a stampede that was cut from the script. Eklund also says there was a close call involving some explosions at the climax, saying that in the scene where Moore helps her to her feet in the midst of explosion is not actually acting. She had fallen and Moore was rescuing her. As much fun as they seem to be having behind the scenes, The Man with the Golden Gun ranks as the only nearly irredeemable Bond film. Breaking it down, there's the script, which is juvenile at best, offensive at worst. I don't know who is to blame for this one, Mankiewicz or Maybaum, and I don't know who they thought they were writing it for, but it sure as heck wasn't Roger Moore. They try to have him play a tough guy, smacking around Maude Adams' character in her hotel room, and hopping into the sack in front of Mary Goodnight, telling her after, don't worry darling, your turn will come. With Connery in the lead, this might have worked. There was a certain aggressiveness and threat to him that audiences could take, even enjoy. Moore, however, comes off as an asshole something he complained about on the DVD commentary, saying it really wasn't until The Spy Who Loved Me that he was able to come into his own, and I'm inclined to agree. He especially hated a scene where Bond, in a rare bully moment, pushes a child into a river in Thailand that Moore says was horribly polluted, and his biography, he says that the scene makes him cringe. Or at least did until he passed away. R.I.P. Raj, we love you. The script only merits about a 4 on 10 and is saved by the characterization of Scaramanga, while Hamilton's direction is incredibly lackluster. You see, the movie as bad as it is though does have one good thing about it, and it's Scaramanga. 
Christopher Lee is very suave, so suave in fact that he feels more like James Bond than James Bond in this movie. I really like the sad story he tells about his elephant friend in the circus and how he became a gun for hire, and no one, but no one, says, come come 007, like him. Come come Mr. Bond, you enjoy the scallop just as much as I do. Please, eat. The baddie gets an eight. The Bond girls, however, are totally wasted in this one. The two Swedes, Britt Eklund and Maud Adams, are lovely, but both are wasted in thankless parts, although of course they both look great in bathing suits. Adams would eventually fare much better playing the title role in Octopussy. The Bond girls here are a 5 on 10, although I don't think you can blame either actress. The action is quite silly with requisite nods to the kung fu craze that dominated pop culture at the time, but it has to be said, Roger Moore is no Bruce Lee. <laughs> There's also a great barrel roll stunt that's ruined by the slide whistle sound effect and the fact that for some harebrained reason, they brought back Clifton James as J.W. Pepper, the racist southern sheriff from Live and Let Die, who of course would be in Thailand at the same time as James Bond, right? Okay. Bond actually only kills one guy in the entire film. Too bad it wasn't J.W. Pepper. Oh. You is ugly. JW. The gadgets are pretty weak, with Q contributing a fake nipple, although the golden gun is pretty nifty. Apparently, Christopher Lee tried to bring it to the States so he could show it off on the Tonight Show, but US Customs weren't having it and confiscated the weapon. Boo. The John Barry score is atypically weak for the maestro, with Barry himself saying it was his worst score ever, reportedly done in a hurry with the theme song by Lulu that he was never happy with. I give it about a 6 on 10, because even John Barry at his worst is better than most composers at their best. The film itself is by far my least favorite James Bond movie, and one of the few that I cannot watch over and over again, so it only gets about a 4 on 10 for me, with it only being saved really by Christopher Lee. Audiences reacted similarly, with many saying that the advertising that went into this was incredibly lackluster, although then again, you can't polish a turd. It only made about half of what Live and Let Die did worldwide, eking out about 97 million. Now, this is far from a disaster for the time, and it was still one of the highest grossing movies of the year. It made a hefty profit, but for James Bond movies, the gross was considered very poor, leading to a complete reboot behind the scenes for the next movie. Ah, but that's a story for another time.